Story three of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by S. S. Kotelianski, eighteen eighty nineteen fifty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three Gooseberries. From early morning the sky had been overcast with clouds. The day was still, cool, and wearisome, as usual on grey, dull days, when the clouds hang low over the fields and it looks like rain, which never comes. Ivan Ivanitch, the veterinary surgeon, and Burkin, the schoolmaster, were tired of walking, and the fields seemed endless to them. Far ahead they could just see the windmills of the village of Meruski, to the right stretched away to disappear behind the village a line of hills and they knew that it was the bank of the river meadows green willows farmhouses and from one of the hills there could be seen a field of endless telegraph posts and the train looking from a distance like a crawling caterpillar and in clear weather even the town in the calm weather when all nature seemed gentle and melancholy Ivan Ivanitch and Burkin were filled with love for the fields and thought how grand and beautiful the country was. Last time when we stopped at Prokofiev's shed, said Burkin, you were going to tell me a story. Yes, I wanted to tell you about my brother. Ivan Ivanitch took a deep breath and lighted his pipe before beginning his story, but just then the rain began to fall and in about five minutes it came pelting down and showed no signs of stopping. Ivan Ivanitch stopped and hesitated. The dogs, wet through, stood with their tails between their legs and looked at them mournfully. "'We ought to take shelter,' said Burkin. "'Let us go to Aliokin. It is close by.' Oh, "'Very well.' They took a short cut over a stubble field and then bore to the right until they came to the road. Soon there appeared poplars, a garden, the red roofs of granaries. The river began to glimmer, and they came to a wide road with a mill and a white bathing-shed. It was Sofino, where Aliokin lived. The mill was working, drowning the sound of the rain, and the dam shook. Round the carts stood wet horses, hanging their heads, and men were walking about with their heads covered with sacks. It was wet muddy and unpleasant, and the river looked cold and sullen. Ivan Ivanitch and Burkin felt wet and uncomfortable through and through. Their feet were tired with walking in the mud, and they walked past the dam to the barn in silence, as though they were angry with each other. In one of the barns a winnowing machine was working, sending out clouds of dust. On the threshold stood Aliokin himself, a man of about forty, tall and stout, with long hair, more like a professor or a painter than a farmer. He was wearing a grimy white shirt and rope belt, and pants instead of trousers, and his boots were covered with mud and straw. His nose and eyes were black with dust. He recognized Ivan Ivanitch and was apparently very pleased. "'Please, gentlemen,' he said, "'go to the house. I'll be with you in a minute.' The house was large and two-storied. Aliokin lived downstairs in two vaulted rooms with little windows designed for the farmhands. The farmhouse was plain, and the place smelled of rye bread and vodka and leather. He rarely used the reception rooms, only when guests arrived. Ivan Ivanitch and Burkin were received by a chambermaid, such a pretty young woman that both of them stopped and exchanged glances. "'You cannot imagine how glad I am to see you, gentlemen,' said Aliokin, coming after them into the hall. "'I never expected you.' "'Piliagra,' he said to the maid, "'give my friends a change of clothes, and I will change too. But I must have a bath. I haven't had one since the spring. Wouldn't you like to come to the bathing-shed? And meanwhile our things will be got ready.' "'Pretty Piliagra, dainty and sweet,' brought towels and soap, and Eliokin led his guests to the bathing-shed. Yes, he said, it is a long time since I had a bath. My bathing-shed is all right, as you see. My father and I put it up. But somehow I have no time to bathe. He sat down on the step and lathered his long hair and neck, and the water round him became brown. 
"'Yes, I see,' said Ivan Ivanitch, heavily, looking at his head. "'It is a long time since I bathed,' said Aliokin shyly, as he soaped himself again, and the water round him became dark blue, like ink. Ivan Ivanitch came out of the shed, plunged into the water with a splash, and swam about in the rain, flapping his arms, and sending waves back, and on the waves tossed white lilies. He swam out to the middle of the pool, and dived, and in a minute came up again in another place, and kept on swimming and diving, trying to reach the bottom. "'Oh, how delicious!' he laughed in his glee. "'How delicious!' He swam to the mill, spoke to the peasants, and came back, and in the middle of the pool he lay on his back to let the rain fall in his face. Burkin and Aliokin were already dressed and ready to go, but he kept on swimming and diving. "'Delicious!' he said. "'Too delicious!' "'You've had enough!' shouted Burkin. They went to the house, and only when the lamp was lit in the large drawing-room upstairs, and Burkin and Ivan Ivanitch, dressed in silk dressing-gowns and warm slippers, lounged in chairs, and Aliokin himself, washed and brushed in a new frock coat, paced up and down, evidently delighting in the warmth and cleanliness and dry clothes and slippers, and pretty Pelagre noiselessly tripping over the carpet and smiling sweetly, brought in tea and jam on a tray, only then did Ivan Ivanitch begin his story, and it was as though he was being listened to, not only by Burkin and Aliokin, but also by the old and young ladies and the officer who looked down so staidly and tranquilly from the golden frames. "'We are two brothers,' he began, "'I, Ivan Ivanitch, and Nikolai Ivanitch, two years younger. I went in for study and became a veterinary surgeon while Nikolai was at the Exchequer Court when he was nineteen. Our father, Chimasha Himalyska, was a cantonist, but he died with an officer's rank and left us his title of nobility and a small estate. After his death the estate went to pay his debts. However, we spent our childhood there in the country. We were just like peasants' children, spent days and nights in the fields and the woods, minded the house, barked the lime-trees, fished, and so on. And, you know, once a man has fished or watched the thrushes hovering in flocks over the village in the bright cool autumn days, he can never really be a townsman, and to the day of his death he will be drawn to the country. My brother pined away in the exchequer. Years passed, and he sat in the same place, wrote out the same documents, and thought of one thing, how to get back to the country. And little by little his distress became a definite disorder, a fixed idea, to buy a small farm somewhere by the bank of a river or a lake. He was a good fellow, and I loved him, but I never sympathized with the desire to shut oneself up on one's own farm. It is a common saying that a man needs only six feet of land. But surely a corpse wants that, not a man. And I hear that our intellectuals have a longing for the land and want to acquire farms. But it all comes down to the six feet of land. To leave town and the struggle and the swim of life and go and hide yourself in a farmhouse is not life, it is egoism laziness. It is a kind of monasticism, but monasticism without action. A man needs not six feet of land, not a farm, but the whole earth, all nature, where in full liberty he can display all the properties and qualities of the free spirit. My brother Nikolai, sitting in his office, would dream of eating his own she, with its savory smell, floating across the farmyard, and of eating out in the open air, and of sleeping in the sun, and of sitting for hours together on a seat by the gate, and gazing at the field and the forest. Books on agriculture and the hints in almanacs were his joy, his favorite spiritual food, and he liked reading newspapers, but only the advertisements of land to be sold, so many acres of arable and grassland, with a farmhouse, river, garden, mill, and mill-pond, 
and he would dream of garden walls, flowers, fruits, nests, carp in the pond, don't you know, and all the rest of it. These fantasies of his used to vary according to the advertisements he found, but somehow there was always a gooseberry bush in every one. Not a house, not a romantic spot could he imagine without its gooseberry bush. Country life has its advantages, he used to say. You sit on the veranda drinking tea, and your ducklings swim on the pond, and everything smells good, and there are gooseberries. He used to draw out a plan of his estate, and always the same things were shown on it. A. Farmhouse. B. Cottage. C. Vegetable garden. D. Gooseberry bush. He used to live meagerly, and never had enough to eat and drink, dressed God knows how, exactly like a beggar, and always saved and put his money into the bank. He was terribly stingy. It used to hurt me to see him, and I used to give him money to go away for a holiday, but he would put that away, too. Once a man gets a fixed idea, there's nothing to be done. Years passed. He was transferred to another province. He completed his fortieth year, and was still reading advertisements in the papers and saving up his money. Then I heard he was married. Still with the same idea of buying a farmhouse with a gooseberry bush, he married an elderly, ugly widow, not out of any feeling for her, but because she had money. With her he still lived stingily, kept her half-starved, and put the money into the bank in his own name. She had been the wife of a postmaster, and was used to good living, but with her second husband she did not even have enough black bread. She pined away in her new life, and in three years or so gave up her soul to God, and my brother never for a moment thought himself to blame for her death. Money, like vodka, can play queer tricks with a man. Once in our town a merchant lay dying. Before his death he asked for some honey, and he ate all his notes and scrip with the honey, so that nobody should get it. Once I was examining a herd of cattle at a station, and a horse-jobber fell under the engine, and his foot was cut off. We carried him into the waiting-room, with the blood pouring down, a terrible business, and all the while he kept on asking anxiously for his foot. He had twenty-five roubles in his boot, and did not want to lose them. "'Now keep to your story,' said Burkin. After the death of his wife, Ivan Ivanitch continued, after a long pause, my brother began to look out for an estate. Of course you may search for five years, and even then by a pig and a poke. Through an agent, my brother Nikolai raised a mortgage, and bought three hundred acres with a farmhouse, a cottage, and a park. But there was no orchard, no gooseberry bush, no duck pond. There was a river, but the water in it was coffee-colored because the estate lay between a brickyard and a gelatin factory. But my brother Nikolai was not worried about that. He ordered twenty gooseberry bushes and settled down to a country life. Last year I paid him a visit. I thought I'd go and see how things were with him. In his letters my brother called his estate Chimbarshov Corner or Himalisko. I arrived at Himalisko in the afternoon. It was hot. There were ditches, fences, hedges, rows of young fir trees, trees everywhere, and there was no telling how to cross the yard or where to put your horse. I went to the house and was met by a red-haired dog as fat as a pig. He tried to bark, but felt too lazy. Out of the kitchen came the cook, barefooted and also as fat as a pig, and said that the master was having his afternoon rest. I went in to my brother and found him sitting on his bed, with his knees covered with a blanket. He looked old, stout, flabby. His cheeks, nose, and lips were pendulous. I half expected him to grunt like a pig. We embraced and shed a tear of joy, and also of sadness, to think we had once been young, but were now both going grey and nearing death. He dressed and took me to see his estate. "'Well, how are you getting on?' I asked. "'All right, thank God. I am doing very well.' He was no longer the poor, tired official 
but a real landowner and a person of consequence. He had got used to the place and liked it, ate a great deal, took Russian baths, was growing fat, had already gone to law with the parish and the two factories, and was much offended if the peasants did not call him your lordship. And like a good landowner, he looked after his soul and did good works pompously, never simply. What good work? He cured the peasants of all kinds of diseases with soda and castor oil, and on his birthday he would have a thanksgiving service held in the middle of the village, and would treat the peasants to half a bucket of vodka, which he thought the right thing to do. Ah, those terrible buckets of vodka! One day a greasy landowner will drag the peasants before the Zimbro court for trespass, and the next, if it's a holiday, he will give them a bucket of vodka, and they drink and shout hooray, and lick his boots in their drunkenness. A change to good eating and idleness always fills a Russian with the most preposterous self-conceit. Nikolai Ivanitch, who, when he was in the exchequer, was terrified to have an opinion of his own, now imagined that what he said was law. Education is necessary for the masses, but they are not fit for it. Corporal punishment is generally harmful, but in certain cases it is useful and indispensable. I know the people, and I know how to treat them, he would say. The people love me. I have only to raise my finger, and they will do as I wish. And all this, mark you, was said with a kindly smile of wisdom. He was constantly saying, we noblemen, or I as a nobleman. Apparently he had forgotten that our grandfather was a peasant, and our father a common soldier. Even our family name, Timaka Himatsky, which is really an absurd one, seemed to him full-sounding, distinguished, and very pleasing. But my point does not concern him so much as myself. I want to tell you what a change took place in me in those few hours while I was in his house. In the evening, while we were having tea, the cook laid a plateful of gooseberries on the table. They had not been bought, but were his own gooseberries, plucked for the first time since the bushes were planted. Nikolai Ivanitch laughed with joy, and for a minute or two he looked in silence at the gooseberries with tears in his eyes. He could not speak for excitement, then put one into his mouth, glanced at me in triumph, like a child at last being given its favorite toy, and said, How good they are! He went on eating greedily, and saying all the while, How good they are! Do try one! It was hard and sour, but as Pushkin said, the illusion which exalts us is dearer to us than ten thousand truths. I saw a happy man, one whose dearest dream had come true, who had attained his goal in life, who had got what he wanted, and was pleased with his destiny and with himself. In my idea of human life there is always some alloy of sadness, but now, at the sight of a happy man, I was filled with something like despair, and at night it grew on me. A bed was made up for me in the room near my brother's, and I could hear him, unable to sleep, going again and again to the plate of gooseberries. I thought, after all, what a lot of contented people there must be! What an overwhelming power that means! I look at this life and see the arrogance and the idleness of the strong, the ignorance and bestiality of the weak, the horrible poverty everywhere, overcrowding, drunkenness, hypocrisy, falsehood. Meanwhile, in all the houses, all the streets, there is peace. Out of fifty thousand people who live in our town, there is not one to kick against it all. Think of the people who go to market for food. During the day they eat, at night they sleep, talk nonsense, marry, grow old, piously follow their dead to the cemetery. One never sees or hears those who suffer, and all the horror of life goes on somewhere behind the scenes. Everything is quiet, peaceful, and against it all there is only the silent protest of statistics. So many go mad, so many gallons are drunk, so many children die of starvation, 
and such a state of things is obviously what we want apparently a happy man only feels so because the unhappy bear their burdens in silence but for which happiness would be impossible it is a general hypnosis every happy man should have some one with a little hammer at his door to knock and remind him that there are unhappy people and that however happy he may be life will sooner or later show its claws and some misfortune will befall him illness poverty loss and then no one will see or hear him just as he now neither sees nor hears others but there is no man with a hammer and the happy go on living just a little fluttered with the petty cares of every day like an aspen tree in the wind and everything is all right that night i was able to understand how i too had been content and happy ivan ivanitch went on getting up i too at meals or out hunting used to lay down the law about living and religion and governing the masses i too used to say that teaching is light that education is necessary but that for simple folk reading and writing is enough for the present freedom is a boon i used to say as essential as the air we breathe but we must wait yes i used to say so but now i asked why do we wait ivan ivanitch glanced angrily at burkin why do we wait i ask you what considerations keep us fast i am told that we cannot have everything at once and that every idea is realized in time but who says so where is the proof that it is so you refer me to the natural order of things to the law of cause and effect but is there order or natural law in that i a living thinking creature should stand by a ditch until it fills up or is narrowed when i could jump it or throw a bridge over it tell me i say why should we wait wait when we have no strength to live and yet must live and are full of the desire to live i left my brother early the next morning and from that time on i found it impossible to live in town the peace and quiet of it oppress me i dare not look in at the windows for nothing is more dreadful to see than the sight of a happy family sitting round a table having tea i am an old man now and am no good for the struggle i commenced late i can only grieve within my soul and fret and sulk at night my head buzzes with the rush of my thoughts and i cannot sleep ah if i were young ivan ivanitch walked excitedly up and down the room and repeated if i were young he suddenly walked up to aliokhin and shook him first by one hand and then by the other pavel konstantinitch he said in a voice of entreaty don't be satisfied don't let yourself be lulled to sleep while you are young strong wealthy do not cease to do good happiness does not exist nor should it and if there is any meaning or purpose in life they are not in our peddling little happiness but in something reasonable and grand do good ivan ivanitch said this with a piteous supplicating smile as though he were asking a personal favour then they all three sat in different corners of the drawing-room and were silent ivan ivanitch's story had satisfied neither burkin nor aliokhin with the generals and ladies looking down from their gilt frames seeming alive in the firelight it was tedious to hear the story of a miserable official who ate gooseberries somehow they had a longing to hear and to speak of charming people and of women and the mere fact of sitting in the drawing-room where everything the lamp with its coloured shade the chairs and the carpet under their feet told how the very people who now looked down at them from their frames once walked and sat and had tea there and the fact that pretty pelagia was near was much nearer than any story aliokhin wanted very much to go to bed he had to get up for his work very early about two in the morning and now his eyes were closing but he was afraid of his guests saying something interesting without his hearing it 
so he would not go. He did not trouble to think whether what Ivan Ivanitch had been saying was clever or right. His guests were talking of neither groats nor hay nor tar, but of something which had no bearing on his life, and he liked it and wanted them to go on. However, it's time to go to bed, said Burkin, getting up. I will wish you good night. Aliokhin said good night and went downstairs and left his guests. Each had a large room with an old wooden bed and carved ornaments. In a corner was an ivory crucifix, and their wide cool beds, made by pretty Pelagria, smelled sweetly of clean linen. Ivan Ivanitch undressed in silence and lay down. "'God forgive me, a wicked sinner,' he murmured, as he drew the clothes over his head. A smell of burning tobacco came from his pipe, which lay on the table, and Burkin could not sleep for a long time, and was worried, because he could not make out where the unpleasant smell came from. The rain beat against the windows all night long. End of Story 3